I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody. This is episode 23 with my oldest son, Turner Rowland. I am so proud of Turner. At 20 years old, he's already worked in Yellowstone National Park. He became a professional wrangler at a high-end guest ranch. And he just recently earned his EMT and wilderness EMT in preparation for becoming an elk hunting guide in the Lee Metcalf wilderness this fall. I jumped in the truck with him on the 4th of July and we traveled across the country together. Some of the best conversations I've ever had with anyone were on long, long drives like this and on the way to go hunting and fishing. And this one was one of those long conversations that I really, really enjoyed. Don't worry. It was safe. We just hit record and we started talking. And it was the first time that I have really had a good chance to, to sit down with him and get the download on what this, what this one month long course that he took in California was all about. It was operated by the National Outdoor Leadership School and he just had a really good experience there. And so it was a great chance for me to ask a lot of questions and hear a lot of stories from that. I'm very excited to bring you this episode from the road somewhere in the middle of the United States of America. Being able to just jump in the car and drive 30 hours at the spur of the moment reminded me of how grateful I am and thankful for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. Thank you to all who have served and sacrificed to earn and preserve this freedom. And thank you to all that are serving and sacrificing today. This episode is brought to you by Waypoint TV. Waypoint TV has over 60 different producers with 2,000 plus episodes of some of the highest quality hunting and fishing content available anywhere. And if you're interested in uh, high-end hunting and fishing content, then you should go check out Waypoint TV. It's available anywhere. You can get it on Apple TV, Roku, God, everywhere on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, and it's also free. So go there and check it out. I think you're really, really going to enjoy it. I know I do. We've got all our episodes there. Every single one of Saltwater Experience is there. Every single one of Into the Blue is there. Every single one of Sweetwater is there. And just so, so many more awesome producers making incredible content. It grows every day. So go check it out at waypointtv.com. We have an email address that has been getting exercised pretty well lately. And I want to thank you all for that. That email address is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That is your direct line to me. If you send me an email at podcast at saltwaterexperience.com, it comes right to my computer and phone. I read every single one of them. And I want to thank you all very much for, uh, for sending them in. Most people have been sending in suggestions for future guests. And there have been some really good suggestions, some of which I have been able to track down, and we have ICAST coming up next week. I am going to sit down with, uh, with a number of those people at ICAST. Where we're all going to be in the same place. It's going to be an easy place for me to catch up with some of the people. I'm really, really, really super excited about who I'm going to sit down with. I don't want to say right now because ICAST is a very busy time for me and also for these guests. So plans have a have a way of falling through. But if it all goes as planned, I'm going to have some really spectacular guests. And one way or another, these people have all been excited about doing the podcast. So I'm going to catch up with them, whether it's at iCast or somewhere else. I will track them down and I will get them. But some good stories coming up next week. And also probably do a podcast just kind of on on, uh, the state of the industry at iCast or at at least some commentary on that. So we have been getting so many of these emails lately, and I really appreciate it. And I've been selecting one every week that really, really uh, speaks to me as the fan of the week. And this week it is Scott Wilson. And I want to read you this because it really, uh, it really was important to me. And I don't know, sometimes, sometimes when you're doing something like this, you think, man, if I could just, if I could just make an impact on one person, it'd all be worth it. If I could just help one person to, uh, to, you know, enjoy hunting and fishing more, enjoy being outside more, kind of get back into fitness, take care of their body, then it'd all be worth it. And this email 
certainly um, was flattering and just made it all worth it to me. Mr. Roland, I want to take a moment to thank you for putting out the podcast. Please keep it up. I've fished my entire life and I've followed your work on TV for a number of years. I was looking for a fishing podcast when I stumbled across yours and I was very excited. I had no idea what I was in for. I absolutely love the diversity of guests you have on. That came as a huge surprise because I thought I was looking for just fishing in a podcast. You've even opened my eyes to health and fitness like never before. Without sounding too cheesy, you've inspired me to get my fitness up to another level. I've been fat and out of shape from age 25 to 42. At 42, I decided enough was enough and I started working out. In the last year and a half, I've really cranked it up. But since learning about the Seal Fit 20X, I've taken it to a whole new level. My goal is to complete a 20X by my 45th birthday next year. I hear you talk about the endurance challenges you've done, and there's no reason I can't do more than what I'm, what I'm currently doing. Age is only an excuse. I say all of that to basically tell you to keep up the outstanding job. Your podcast is a million times better than I ever could have imagined it would be. You're far better at interviewing and asking questions than I would have believed if I didn't hear it for myself. You're certainly a man of many talents. Thank you. So, Scott, those are nice things to say, and I really appreciate it. And I don't know if I'm any good at this or not. I enjoy it. And I think that might be why it comes off that, uh, that, that I might be good at it. It's, it's because I enjoy it. And uh, if you're following your passion, I think you tend to be a little bit better than if you're just kind of slaving away. But kudos to you, man. Age is only a number. And at 45, you can do absolutely anything. The 20X from Seal Fit, Mark Devine. At Seal Fit is uh, is an amazing person. He will turn into a great mentor for you. The coaches that you're going to experience there at the 20X, it, it's a life changing experience. And kudos to you for doing it. And I wish you all the best. If I can help you in your training leading up to it, let me know. And I would love to hear a to get an email from you after you're finished and see what you thought about it. So anyway, Scott go get it. So thanks everybody for listening. Our downloads are going up every day, every week, every month. And a lot of that is due to you, the listener who is telling other people about this podcast. If you share it on social media and, and really particularly if you rate it and review it on iTunes, that makes a huge, huge difference. And we've got a lot of great ratings there. So if you like this, please take the time to hit that five stars to give it a, uh, a good review. And uh, that really goes a long, long way. So thanks so much for listening. And let's get this, let's get to this incredible conversation that I'm going to have with my son, Turner Rowland. What's going on, Turner? Nothing much. Just um, driving to Montana right now. Yeah, I know. Fourth of July weekend, Turner and I, my son Turner, who is almost 21, are driving across the country because he is uh, headed back to Montana to embark on a new deal. But I wanted to catch up to him. This is an amazing time because I have 27 hours with him being held captive in my car or in his car, and we get a chance to catch up. So you don't often get a get 27 hours with your grown child to find out what's going on. But Turner just came back from a trip that he's going to tell us about which really I think might have been somewhat life-changing, a real real uh, departure from from what he's done. But where, where did you just come back from, Turner? Yeah, I just came back from uh, Mount Shasta, California, doing a, a wilderness EMT course, and that was amazing. It was brought to me by Knowles, which I really had no idea about um, and just completely blew me away. So um, Knowles is the National Outdoor Leadership School, right? Yeah, that's right. They do trips all over the country and the world actually a couple of my buddies have done um spent some time in uh, india with them and in the himalayas climbing and i just got back from their their uh, wilderness emt course that was just absolutely incredible it was a semester course condensed down into um, i think 16 or 17 classroom days that just blew me away completely um and then uh just a couple days ago, took the national registry exam, and now I'm a uh, certified wilderness EMT. That's 
really cool. And so this course that you took, tell me about, I mean, we haven't had a chance to catch up on it really, but so the thing is held in Washington, is that correct? Mount Shasta, California. California. So Northern California, about probably 50 minutes from uh, the Oregon border. Okay. And so when you get there, what, what did you expect? Or what did you, uh, what did you encounter once you got there? And what kind of preparation did you have to do to, to get ready for this, this school? Oh, man. Well, they told me it was going to be intensive. But coming from a Knowles course that um, on the surface looked a lot like a um, really an adventure more than a classroom setting, I didn't really think it was going to be that intensive. Um, so I did, I did my uh, required pre-reading. They give you a book. You have to, you have to buy the um, emergency medicine book and... Um, do your pre-readings. You have a, you have a required uh, five days of, of pre-reading, so that's about uh, 15 chapters that you have to read before. And you get there, and you jump right in. Very intensive from the start, covering topics from basic stuff like uh, cuts or, or lacerations to um, emergency childbirth to uh, open <laughs> fractures in the wilderness, um, every, anything and everything that you might encounter. I mean, it's always good to be able to deliver a baby. You never know when you're going to take a pregnant woman <laughs> elk hunting. <laughs> you could take a pregnant woman fly fishing. I've done that a number of times. Yeah. Uh, glad I didn't have to deliver a baby. But So you, you start right into these scenarios, or do they lay some groundwork first? I mean, you pretty much jump head first in. You know, first day is... Uh, that morning is really the only relaxed time you have. You got to do um, some paperwork for the um, clinical rotations in the hospital. The state of California actually requires, by law, three eight-hour clinical rotations in the emergency room. Yeah. So we had to do paperwork for that. We had to do paperwork for NOLs and um, for liability purposes. And then that afternoon, we jumped straight into it. I can't remember exactly. I think we t covered like basic, basic anatomy like terms like proximal and distal and, and medial and lateral there. And then jumping right into preparing for our first scenario. And a scenario was basically we had three teams, lions, tigers, and bears. Um, and one of those teams would be the patient. And we, they would, um, the instructors would give us various injuries or reasons why we were injured or could not move or call for help. And the rescuers, the other two teams, would have to um, give care and um, find out a way to um, get them out of there. And whether that's a rapid or pretty uh, relaxed evac, um, whether it's usable or unusable. And just make a plan. What does that, that mean, usable or unusable for so, the evac? Yeah, so if you sprain your ankle or... or oh, oh, um, the, oh your, your actual body part yeah, is usable. Yeah, yeah, oh, Okay. So we would have anywhere from one to three scenarios a day from that point forward. And then we would have um, really big scenarios like search and rescue scenarios. We, um, we also had best instructors. One of them was a 15-year uh, flight paramedic super smart, super cool dude. One of them um, was a hot shot in the Aldo Leopold National Forest. And one of them was a uh, ski patroller and EMT in um, Jackson Hole in the Jackson Hole Ski Resort. Wow. So that was your that was your instructor base. But I'm, I'm interested, like, what kind of people did you encounter that are that are your classmates in something like this? What, oh, yeah. What what makes somebody want to go and 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 get this really condensed EMT and wilderness EMT course. Yeah, so we had a very, very wide variety of people going there and what they would use it for. Anywhere from, uh, we had one, one girl who was a fourth year medical student, super smart, a lot of pre-med students, a couple people who wanted to do ski patrol, and um, a couple people who were going, actually trying to go into the um, special forces the Marine Special Forces, and people from all walks of life, really, people who just wanted to be prepared for an emergency. If, um, say, you know, their grandparents are getting a little older, if something happens to them, they want to know what to do. They want to know what to do if they walk in a restaurant and someone's collapsed on the floor, and just help out their community, be prepared for an emergency. And so 
I know what this is, but tell me what the reasoning behind your your motivation to go and take a course like this. Yeah, so um, part of it was I've always been interested in medicine and um, just learning about it and being prepared for emergencies. But the main part was um, because of the wilderness aspect of the wilderness EMT. We're driving up to Montana right now, and I actually start packing for an elk outfit starting um, August 1st in the um, Lee Metcalf Wilderness area and and um, and going to guide um, elk hunts this fall for the first time. So really excited about that and now really prepared for um, any possible emergencies out there. Well, when you first brought this to my attention and, and asked me what I what I thought about it, I can remember like it was yesterday and my initial reaction was well, yeah, why, why wouldn't you want to do something like that? I mean, you got the time. We're able to send you to something like that. And I, I explained to you Nick Saban's and or but deal, which I, which I really like. And for the listeners, it is Nick Saban, I think, is the one credited with this. Uh, at least it, that's the way it was told to me, is that you have two recruits, two people coming in. That both, both play wide receiver, let's say. They run the same 40. They run, they've scored the same number of touchdowns. They had the same number of catches last year. Across the board, they are, they are even. They're the same age. They can bench press and squat the same amount. Uh, their vertical leap is, is virtually the same. And you have all of these, you have all of these uh, stats. And you're at the coaches meeting, and one of the, one, the wide receiver coach is telling Nick Saban about all these guys. This guy could be maybe the fastest guy in college football. He can do all of these things. And then he waits until the end. And at the end, there's either an and or there's a but. So he could possibly be the fastest player in college football. He had more catches last year than anyone else. But he's had a little trouble with the law. But he doesn't play well with others in the locker room but he tends to be kind of a cancer to the team. But, you know, and he's waiting for the but, or he's waiting for the and. So this guy is, uh, is one of the fastest players in college football. He had almost as many receptions as, as, or he's number two in receptions, and he was an Eagle Scout as a kid, and he was his high school valedictorian, and he was, in this case, a, a trained EMT. And that's one of the things that, that I have tried to convey to you is that you're always trying to get more things in that and column. Like you are a beginning elk guide at this point. You don't have a lot of experience. Say there's two or three people that are going to this same outfitter and they're, they're looking at hiring one of these three people. And you pretty much match up all along the lines and then, but you have the and He's a wilderness EMT and an EMT and whatever else. So I'm really proud of you for, for doing that. And you, you squarely put an and in your, in your uh, world, which is huge. I, and I know you feel good about that. And I know that you can see it now because you were telling me already about many of the opportunities that exist for an EMT or exist as a springboard off of the EMT that you didn't really know about or weren't aware of before you went to those classes. So what do you, what do you think uh, are some of the possibilities that they illustrated for you of what you could do with, with an EMT? Well, there's lots you can do with an EMT, um, especially a wilderness EMT. Not only the opportunities just open up, you know, doors open wide um, in the wilderness aspect of things, like, uh, like a climbing guide is... Um, very, an EMT, a wilderness EMT is very valued as a climbing guide, uh, mountaineering, uh, packing, anything like that. With just EMTs, ER techs, if you want to work in ER, uh, EMTs required. Ski patrol, a lot of ski patrols. The one I'm looking at is Big Sky Montana. They require EMT basic as their baseline. So very important there. Also, you know, a lot of fun if you like to. You can, of course, work in an ambulance. That is very exciting from what I hear. Um, I've, I've never done a ride along, but it, it looks very exciting from the ER clinicals that I've done. Um, everyone seems, for the most part, pretty pleased with their job. 
So we were we were just starting to talk about um, uh, the possibilities of, of what what and we, it came off of you telling me about the other people that were were in your class. Uh, who else were you saying was in your class? What other type of people? Medical what, students. Right. And and what what were these people planning on doing with the EMT? Um, well, a lot of them. Uh, I would say most of them were um, pre-med students who was like, who were, um, you know, just thinking, man, you know, the medical community looks awesome. I'm pretty sure I want to do this, but you know, let's go ahead and make sure. Let's do this month-long intensive course because if I get into med school, medical school and don't like it, then, you know, I'm, I've, I've kind of set myself back a little bit. So let's go and do this really intensive, pretty difficult course, um, and let's just make sure. Man, what a great. <laughs> what a great opportunity to make sure because I once spoke to a young lady who was one of the sharpest people I've ever met in my life and she had a nursing degree and, and finally got her, her nursing degree and started practicing and realized I don't like nursing and I was kind of like wow, didn't wasn't there an opportunity somewhere along the line to try it for a month or a summer or to have any idea of what what you were going to encounter when you got in there, and I just thought, man, what a, what an incredible waste of time to to get that degree, and then with and then your first experience is your is your time on the job, like that didn't seem all that smart to me for someone who is who was really a very very sharp person, but really her her first experience with nursing was when she got her first nursing job. She had not done any shadowing or anything like that and was really surprised at how much she didn't like it once yeah. she got there. Yeah, it's definitely not for everybody. You know, especially the ER, um, some people get burnt out really, really fast. Um, and not having personally experienced that, I, I've seen it on other doctors just um, from talking to them and especially nurses. But, you know, this, this program, this Knowles Wilderness Medicine program, it's fantastic. Even if you don't want to do anything related to wilderness medicine, you get great experience in the ER. Um, you get to talk to doctors and nurses, and they give you honest opinions about what it's really like because they don't really want to talk to you anyways because you're just an EMT student. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a fantastic way to really, really nail down what you want to do um, if you're thinking about being in the medicine Career. Medical field. Medical field. So yeah. that's uh, and, and did you? What was your experience with, with, with all of this? Did you? Did it make you want more, or satisfied with what you have, or what? You mean like further education? Yeah. Like, do you want more experience in the oh, medical field? Less yeah. experience in the medical field? No. Did the hospitals turn you off, or was it really interesting to you? I don't. I don't know. Oh no! I ate it all up because of my personality when I really like something I ask a lot of questions and the doctors got really annoyed with me really <laughs> fast because <laughs> I was asking so many questions um, but no I loved it I ate it up um, definitely a um, a uh, big almost perspective change on um, the way I, I currently currently see education um, and um, possible career fields down the road um, and some, some people in my class really didn't like it, but to their credit, everyone stuck it out, but they definitely decided that medicine was not for them, which it's not for everybody, um, certainly. So when, you, when you're thinking about medicine, are you more interested in kind of the first responder idea, or are you more interested in possibly pursuing, becoming more involved in, in medicine to the, to, on the path of a doctor, or... Are you, are you mostly interested in this as it relates to your, your passion in the outdoors? Yeah, so short answer is I really don't know. Yeah. Um, well, you're very young. Yeah, yeah, that's the advantage of being very young. You don't have to know. But I like the first responder. There are a lot of things that I don't like about it. You know, your job is to get, get people having the worst day of their lives and drop them off at the hospital. You know, you don't know what happens to them, which I would really like to see that patient care through and get to see him, you know, walk out of the hospital. Another thing that I wasn't really too big on in the emergency care was that burnout is um, very common. And 
you know, the ER isn't really a place where you want to go. Um, I'm very interested in pursuing a further career in medicine, but I want to be, I want to have a place where people go and they leave happy. Everything about where, what, what I'm doing is, is, is everybody's happy. You know, they might, they might not come there happy, but they're going to leave happy at least. Yeah. The ER, you know, just there, people are having the worst days of their, of their lives and you are helping them, but there's a lot of times where you just can't do much, which is where burnout comes from, I think. But I, I want to see that patient care um, through it all, um, whether that's from, um, you know, surgery or just uh, a basic physician or physician's assistant. Um, but just seeing that patient care through more and yep. um, seeing that patient more and seeing that patient progress is very important to me. Well, that's interesting. It'll be, it'll be uh, I'll, I'll be curious to see where, where this new door that you just opened leads you to whether it's a career in medicine or or uh i don't know it it's it's exciting it's always exciting when 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 you open that door and there's this whole new world that you did that you didn't know existed or you just weren't interested enough to to you know venture down that path or or whatever but for some reason or another you get to that door it opens and you see this entire world inside of in this case the medical field and uh and that can that can spur your interest that's how that's how i got into the fishing was was that i mean i was just guiding for what i thought was going to be a summer job and uh boy did did that change quickly when i was around really good people that i'm realizing after i had been there for a little bit i'm like this this guy is a career guide and he's got a a husband and a wife and kind of ask him like can you really do this can you really make a living as a as a guide and I remember my friend Chris Patterson he uh he was one that I that I think about all the time when I think about someone who showed me the possibilities of of making a career in the outdoors and he simply kind of shrugged his shoulders and said well I don't know if you can do it but I'm doing it and, <laughs> and I was just like well I guess that's perfect you got you got a baby and a and a wife and you're supporting them and so that really was a paradigm shift for me of thinking, wow, this isn't just a summer job. This is, this is a possible career. This is a possible opportunity to, to make a living and do exactly what you want to do. Well, that's cool, man. So tell me more about the course. So you do all of these. We got off track there a little bit, but you, you were telling me about doing all the different scenarios. So how far... What what are the what are the parameters of what an EMT can do? Like, tell me about the training and and what what kind of scenarios you went through, and then now that you are a, a certified EMT nationwide, what would that what would your job be? At what point do you stop that you cannot go any further in your aid of someone? Yeah. So um, EMT. Well, every medical professional has what's called their scope of practice. Right. And that's basically what they can do legally for this patient. So I cannot legally give sutures to a patient with a, with a large laceration just okay. because, the, because that's out of my scope of practice. I haven't had that training yet. I can, however, give oxygen, reduce dislocations, splint, and provide basically an EMT provides primary life care and by primary life care I mean addressing immediate life threats so if the patient is bleeding out stop the bleeding under pretty much all circumstances mm -hmm. if the patient is having trouble breathing give them oxygen open their airway if the patient you know is having real circulation problems because of a open fracture on their femur well reduce that open fracture and get blood circulation circulating properly. EMT is pretty limited in what they can do with uh, um, you know pharmaceuticals um, and administering medications. You can give like aspirin. Uh, oxygen is classified as a drug mm -hmm. um, so you can always give oxygen um, under 99% of th the circumstances. You can help with the administration of nitroglycerin for chest pain and uh, epinephrine if it's prescribed. Um, there, there are 
what's called the five patient rights, where you have to go down and and address each one of those and make sure that it's you know the patient's medication is in date. And, but basically, you're addressing life threats, and um, if they need to go to the hospital, you bring them to the hospital, and then you provide. Um, we call them soap reports. I don't know what um, the whole EMT community calls them, but basically, it's a uh, it's you know I have a blank year old patient with a chief complaint of back pain or chief complaint of leg pain, who is A and O times four, and that's you know awake and oriented times times four, which is uh, you know they know person place time event, mm-hmm. um, and you know after that you give your head to toe exam, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, and the findings on that, and then vital signs, and, and uh, your um, differential diagnosis, differential diagnosis, so, you know, I think it could be a heart attack, or I think it could be anything, really. Yeah. And then from there, the doctors and the nurses take it over. Um, in, in that scope of emergency medicine, there are uh, EMT advances, EMTAs, um, that are primarily in more rural communities that can give more administrations. They can uh, ventilate a patient in different ways. And then there are paramedics who are highly, highly trained. They go through a year and a half of intense schooling and are more probably more similar to basically an emergency nurse um, than an EMT. They can give lots of medications. They can do lots lots more things than EMT can and they're they're very smart that's a that's something that um I actually had a misconception of that you know EMTs and paramedics they're like kind of smart but they're not doctor level no they're very smart they're they're very smart they worked hard to get get through school just like just like nurses but not quite to that level yeah yeah there's there's a lot of different um scopes of practices in emergency medicine that's cool. And so, what what's the difference between a, a wilderness EMT and a and a regular EMT? I'm imagining that a wilderness EMT. I mean, the the number one thing that that I would see is either a heart attack or a fall, in 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 the in the wilderness. Or I don't know. You could sh- you could get shot. You could get an arrow stuck in you from a you're falling. There's a million things that could happen. But when you when you did like you got two certifications, an EMT and a wilderness EMT. How did the two differ from one another? The best way to explain it would probably be scope of practice. Your scope of practice in the wilderness opens wide open because nobody's there to help you. Right. You're not getting out there anytime soon. So, you know, you can you can do more things. You could administer more more drugs because it's, you know, it's that person's life. And if you don't administer that drug, then, then something really bad could happen to them. So... It really opens up wide. The primary um, thing about wilderness medicine is um, deciding whether they need to get out of there now, or you know maybe we can take it a little easy and make this person comfortable while we get out of there, or can they stay? Yeah. You know, if you if you dislocate your finger and pop it back in and it feels fine, that doesn't mean that you need to get out of there. You know, they right. they still have right. fun points left. They can they can hang around, but um, a lot of abdominal you know things that you know recognizing what what is an emergency and what isn't you know if they have if they have you know stomach cramps for a couple hours they can hang they can hang and play you know they don't have to get out of there but if they have continual stomach cramps that are worsening for 48 hours then that's something probably that needs to be addressed right um so just just recognizing signs of uh um uh, an emergency and, and, and getting them out of there and, and possibly addressing more things in the wilderness and being more care oriented than rather than transport um, oriented. Um, what does that mean? Care, more care oriented than transport oriented? Like you're, you're going to administer something to make them feel better rather than try to get them out of there? Um, not necessarily. Well, I should probably back up. You, you are always transport-oriented when you need to be, um, and you're always care-oriented when you need to be. So if, uh, a, if a person's having an asthma attack and they don't have their inhaler, they need to get out of there, mm-hmm. right? But if a person having an asthma attack and they have their inhaler and it always helps, then you need to be 
you know, more care oriented and give that medication to them. And then, you know, it's probably going to help. And if they have more doses left on their medication, then they can, they can stay in play. Um, and, you know, also it's, it's something that they deal with. They know when it's serious and when it's not serious. Um, um, that's something that you deal with a lot with, um, like diet, diabetics, you know, they have it under control. Um, usually, especially if they're going out into the wilderness, they wouldn't be going out into the wilderness unless they had it, have it under control pretty well. So they, they know, they know when it's, um, an emergency and when it's not an emergency, unless they're unconscious. But, um, another aspect of wilderness medicine is always having a plan. So if you were bringing a diabetic out there, you need to say, okay, well, the way I go about it is, all right, this is something that you deal with always. You've done a really good job of dealing with it. So you're going to deal with it and I'm going to help if I need to. So where's your medication? Let's have another set of medication in case that one gets lost. Let's put all of it in a dry bag and let's get, let's have a plan at each one of our stops on how we get out of there. Um, so, you know, whether that means um, every single person who is with that person carries a packet of sugar just in case they, they collapse with some sort of hyper or hypoglycemia. But, you know, just a lot of wilderness medicine is just recognizing what needs to be addressed very quickly and what needs to be brought out very quickly and what can stay in play. Because, um, you know, the wilderness is a lot of fun, um, but it can also be pretty dangerous if you don't immediately address some things that need to be immediately addressed. But, you know, if someone's, if someone's having a good time still, there's no reason to get them out of there because the wilderness is a lot of fun. You know, you're on a climbing trip or a rafting trip. They, they want to stay. Yeah. Um, and you're going to do everything in your power to allow them to stay. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, what you're, what you're talking about, even just with something as, sim as, as simple as, as a diabetic person that wants to go on a fly fishing trip, or a whitewater rafting trip, I mean, especially the fly fishing trip, my, my experience there is being out, out west, I would have eight to 10 different rivers that I could go and fish on. Some are inaccessible uh, once you pass a certain point. Others, there's a boat ramp every five miles. And just, just in what you're talking about, about what you learned about creating a plan and, and knowing the right questions to ask and, and uh, talking to the person and even asking, is there, does anyone have any, any health issues here uh, or medical issues? That is so beneficial to an outfitter because the easiest way to, um, to avoid an issue is to never get in a situation where you can't get help. Right, like if you have a diabetic person and you have now passed the point of, of no return on the South Fork of the Snake River and now it's 27 miles to the next takeout and it's steep canyon walls on both sides, cell phones don't work very well, that's not a good place to have a problem, right? Like there's not anyone that's going to come for help. But if you're only a couple of miles away from a boat ramp and cell phones work well, then you are always staying in a in a good and responsible position for that person, and that is that is really big as you start into the into the uh, guiding business, whether that's elk hunting or fishing uh, on a river or fishing on the ocean. That EMT course is highly recommended for anyone, wouldn't you? I mean, what I'm what I'm seeing in just the short amount of time that you've been back and the way that you are that your thought pattern has changed as far as okay how do we do this responsibly uh as far as you know if someone has a medical condition how do we tailor this trip so that if there is a problem it's going to be a minor problem not a major problem um i would think you know, this is something that I should have done a long time ago, and I've I've always had the the minor required things of CPR, CPR and first aid that are required for your captain's license or for your guide's license. But I have never gone down this EMT route, and this Knowles course sounds like something that a lot of people would be interested in because it's incredibly condensed, right? Like this would m normally take you a six semester. months, a yeah. semester. Yeah, so 
four to six months. And so tell me about the day. How, how do they condense it and maintain the quality? They're, they're condensing it from six months or a semester to one month. So how do they do that and maintain the quality of learning? Yeah, so, um, you know, first and foremost, you have, in my opinion, some of the best instructors that you could ever ask for. Just very helpful, extremely nice. Um, they're always giving productive criticism, always. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, class starts at 8, goes till 5, and a lot of times you have night sessions that go until 10. One big thing that I saw was the scenarios. One of the instructors who was the ski patrolman at um, Jackson Hole told us that, told us how lucky we are because he, when he went through his EMT course, he had one scenario <laughs> the whole semester. And it was in front of everybody. And the instructor was, was standing there with his arms crossed and they had an unresponsive patient right there and they had to figure out what was wrong. And he said that nobody did it perfect because nobody's done it before. And so we had, we had one to three scenarios every day and a, and a really, really big scenario every week. Well, one of those scenarios you posted on Instagram and scared your mother to death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Turner posted a picture of himself on Instagram and his entire abdominal region is, is covered in blood. He's got blood all over his hands. He's got blood everywhere. And I thought my wife was going to have a heart attack when she saw it. <laughs> but I don't know what that scenario was. Looked like maybe you had to get your appendix out. <laughs> I actually, um, I actually had an evisceration. It was a um, an evisceration is when you're when you have a um, a cut in your ab abdominal wall and your intestines are are um, spilling out. And the scenario was we were in a plane crash and there was um, one person with an amputation and missing eye, one person with evisceration, one person with a um, severe concussion, and uh, I think one another person with some sort of respiratory failure or I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. But anyways, learning through scenarios is the best way to learn, absolutely. Um, it's like reading a book on fly fishing and then actually going fly fishing instead yeah. of reading a book on fly fishing and never going fly right, fishing. You're right. not going to learn anything from the book right. unless you apply it. And so that, that daily application was crucial in learning those skills, you know, because you read in a book, Okay, first thing you do is check ABCs, which is airway breathing circulation. Well, you're not going to do that unless you do that 50 times. Right. Every time. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And, and um, the way they condensed it was great. Um, you know, you have, a, you have to make above an 80 in the course, 80%. And you have uh, quizzes and tests throughout the course. I think a couple of them are online, and we were actually encouraged to, to work together on those, which was awesome, and, and um, I actually learned a lot from those. And then I think the other four or five were closed book, closed neighbor, um, all online, and then a final test, and then a wilderness first responder test, and also a CPR test pretty early in the course. And then after that, you graduate and you get to take the national registry exam. So really condensed, really high paced, but I could not think of a better way to learn it for my learning style, at least. That's awesome, man. So let me ask you this about the wilderness deal, because you just said you had a scenario where there was a plane crash and somebody lost their eye. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing if you've got a really super nice medical kit there and you could use anything you want, but are they telling you things like, okay, you've got to find something to stop the bleeding. Could be a t-shirt, could be something out of your backpack, could be the rod sack out, off, of your, off of your fly rod. Like, are they, are they going into things like that or, or are you trying to do this with, with medical supplies that you may or may not have in an actual wilderness scenario? Yeah, so a little bit of both, actually. So early in the course, probably first couple of weeks, um, we were using medical supplies. And that's to establish a baseline so you know what the best thing to use yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Right? So um, you, would have, you would always have what we called red bags. And that was, that were, uh, they consisted of six cravats. Um, What's a cravat? It's a triangle bandage. So okay. it's like a big bandana. All right. Really. Like, if you fold a bandana in half, it, 
it creates a triangle, and it's just a big triangle that you can use for um, splinting, stuffing, bleeding, all everything. You use it for everything, um, and you can tie it in knots real nice. So we had six of those, like a little Sam splint, which I, I, I never used. I didn't like those things. They're basically a foam roller with a bunch of wire sticking through them, um, covered in foam, so you can mold them. But I always just used um, uh, padding and compression to make my splints. And so you had a stethoscope, blood pressure cup, six cravats, um, and that was really it, you know, and a pulse oximeter, which, which told your um, oxygen saturation of your blood so you could administer oxygen accordingly if you needed to. But that's really all we had. We had, um, for the first couple of scenarios, so for that scenario that I posted on Instagram, we had most medical supplies. We had oxygen. We were a, the scenario where was um, a, a search and rescue team called into a plane accident, and you find what you find. Um, all our scenarios were you find what you find. So everything was a surprise. It was really, really cool. Um, so you go in there, and, and um, you didn't know what you could find. You could find um, any sort of altitude sickness or any sort of life-threatening injury. Hmm. And then you would have to base those injuries. You'd have to look at those injuries and be like, okay, well, we need to get this person out first, or we need to get this person out first, or, okay, this person is is only experiencing uh, mild injury, so, you know, we can kind of be re more relaxed with him, but this person we need to get out real mm -hmm. fast, real fast. Um, and then, um, yeah, so as the course progressed, we, we had uh, less and less stuff. We had to um, make our own what are called litters, so kind of similar to a backboard in a way. Um, they're what you see um, uh, helicopters come down and scoop up the patients with. Yeah. Um, and so we had to make our own of those. Um, and then we had to be transported on those, which you've, if you've ever been transported on a backboard <laughs> or a litter, it is not a good time. Um, I, I, I did not have a fun time um, being transported on those. I would much rather be, be um, the one carrying it. Did you ever get dumped off? No, I never got dropped. I definitely thought I was going to be, though. Um, and yeah, when I was in Seal Fit Kokoro, that was one of the things that they did is uh, we were on this mountain. It was 13 miles up, 13 miles down, and uh, the instructors told us to do something. They told us to walk in a single file line down the mountain and, and be completely silent. And they took off in the van, and of course, we walked about two miles in a single file line and everything was was good and then we decided ah, those guys are going to meet us at the bottom so we all started breaking up into little groups and talking and doing exactly what they told us not to <laughs> the the instructors bust out of the woods and and hit us with all of this um glow in the dark stuff that comes out of the siloom lights everybody's dead everybody's dead get your groups back together and they threw these crappy little uh stretchers down and said now one of your people has to be carried uh, to make things more difficult. Well, I was the smallest one, so they wanted to carry me. And I know exactly what you're talking about, about getting carried. It's not fun. I ended up on my head a couple of times, and uh, it, it was not not a good time. I would have much preferred to, to carry rather than be carried. Uh, not not a good time at all. And what's, we, what's even worse, when somebody has to carry you on their shoulder, like poor Will Kelly, we were doing the Go Rucks, uh, Go Ruck Challenge uh, uh, just a just a regular go ruck uh, event, and uh, some somehow he he got killed, and we had to carry him, or he had his leg blown off or something in a in a in a fake scenario, and so we had to carry him on our shoulders for miles, <laughs> and let me tell you, it was way easier on the people that were carrying versus him with my shoulder stuck in his stomach. Uh, being carried for miles that was he got the worst end of it anyway well that's really cool so so but they did um, in some of the scenarios just just have you create medical supplies out yeah of what was there yeah so um, the uh, actually the final um, wilderness scenario for our wilderness first responder course is um, is actually something that every wilderness first responder um, comes across and i um, not going to give too many details about it because it needs to come as a surprise. It's something pretty, 
pretty cool and special, um, but really you take what you need on a day hike. They're like, look, pack what you have on a day hike. Don't cheat because we're going to look through your bags. And you have to address injuries with what you have on a day hike. You know, who carries a 60-piece first aid kit <laughs> on a day hike? Nobody, right? Unless you're, you know, paranoid. But um, you have to address what you find with the materials that you have. And um, it was really cool, very eye-opening. And, and because of the way they set it up where you use the perfect equipment first, you know exactly what you have to model it after. Yeah, yeah that's and a great so idea. And you so you make a, I mean, you make, you make um, what you make and it, it works. Right. So how does, how does this, uh, this education that you just have, how does this change how you prepare for a day hike, for a backpacking trip, for an elk hunting trip, for a fly fishing day? What are you now carrying that you would were not carrying before or what I guess what should everyone be carrying on a simple day hike as far as basic medical supplies I mean it, it's it, it serves no one any purpose to have a cravat if you don't know what a cravat is or you don't know how to use it so having some experience now you now know okay well these things are essential and I, I didn't even know what they were two weeks ago and now I don't know how I could do a day hike without them so tell me what your what your minimum your bare minimum thing is for uh, for, for, for for me whatever. personally yeah like if you're going out me and you are going to go on a day hike what are you going to throw in your are you going to throw in anything different after this course than you would have thrown in before the course oh man that's a good question for a day hike I probably wouldn't change too much depending on the terrain that we're in. You know, if we're going to a day hike to the top of a mountain, maybe I would I would bring some extra supplies. But you know, basic first aid kit you get, at, you know, REI or or anything. Um, I would definitely say the most important thing about a fir first aid kits in general is you need to open it up and you need to know how to use every single piece of gear in there. And if you don't, you need to throw it out. Yeah. Or you need to learn how to use it. More importantly. Well, what if what if you just have it? And I mean, is there any hope that somebody might be on the trail that does know how to use it? I mean, I, I, I know yeah. I know what you're saying is that if it's if you don't know how to use it, you might as well just throw it out. But what if it's something kind of crucial that you just don't know how to use? Is there any point in just keeping it in there just in case somebody else might know how to use it? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, totally. Um, but don't count on that. Right. You know? Right. It's very important that you need to know it's very important that you know how to use every single piece of gear in your kit but for day hikes i mean a couple bandages uh probably a, a 10 cc syringe to irrigate a cut or something like that um if it's deep definitely 100 percent on every um wilderness trip that i take i bring aspirin with me 100% um, for uh, any sort of chest pain with uh, make sure they don't have any contraindications of it but 100% aspirin definitely going to take that some sort of bandage that you can cover any 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 large cut some sort of uh, gauze to stop the bleeding or any sort of bleeding that you may have really you know customize your first first aid kit to to meet your needs and, and what right. you're going to see like you don't need to you know you don't you don't need to bring a, a a sat phone on a on a hike where you have reception the whole time right you know? right of course so what about what about as you increase in difficulty um and now you're incorporating hunting now you either have a bow or a gun and uh you're preparing for an overnight how does that affect your, your first aid kit? Yeah, so probably the biggest thing would probably be splinting supplies, um, especially where I am in the um, Lee Metcalf wilderness. Um, definitely some sort of splinting supplies. So, you know, you can use your pack for a splint. So really just extra clothes for padding and something to, to put compression on it, like a simple ace bandage, you know, a couple of those. I'd bring more medications, more, more aspirin, definitely Benadryl. 
um, in case there's any sort of allergic reaction. Some sort of painkillers if we're in the wilderness context. Um, you know, so if they if they strain their ankle and it's still usable, but it really hurts, even give a little Advil. Um, and um, really, just just a basic first aid kit covers a lot of stuff if now, you know how to use everything. Yeah. Now tell me this: as you're going back, and anyone is going back into uh, a wilderness area, whether that's the ocean or a, a river or a mountain, you're in a wilderness area. It's somewhat inaccessible. There aren't road signs every every block. You have a GPS with you, either on your boat or you have it um, uh, a handheld GPS. And someone did. I, I want to know if they went over this scenario. Someone encounters a fall. They fall off a they fall off a 25 foot bluff. You do what you can as an EMT, but they they need a helicopter evacuation. Okay, like that's you just know that immediately. Okay, this is this is bad, and they need a, they need to be evacuated. How do you relay your position? Did they go over that? Like, are you doing that by uh, by by lat long coordinates, or are you doing that by um, telling them, well, I'm I'm you know a half mile from this trailhead. What how are did they give you like a, is there a protocol that you're supposed to use like if you were to use the sat phone or you were to use the 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 cell phone how are you relaying your position to the first responders yeah so if you have a gps lat long it's great you know if you don't landmarks you got to know what trail you're on you got to know the area um, but really a, something a lot of people don't understand is a helicopter is a last resort there's a lot of scenarios and situations where a helicopter cannot land or they have to turn back. Um, helicopters are not reliable. A helicopter is a you're trapped here and you're not getting out kind of thing. If you can get out by any means, get out. A helicopter is definitely, definitely, definitely last resort. It's helicopter specifically, helicopters are specifically meant for situations where you where evacuation is extremely difficult and um, you know not getting out of there soon helicopters are not meant for addressing life threats so if someone's having a heart attack the best thing to do is not call a helicopter best thing to do is call uh, you know an ALS ambulance because they'll actually get you out of there faster and there's less of a chance that they have to turn around what the the flight paramedic was telling us a lot of stories where they would go to a wilderness context exactly like what you're talking about and you know a flashing yellow light would turn on they have to turn around wow. lots of times he said countless times the flashing yellow light is low fuel or because they can't land anything anything okay. you know that the, the you so know. now they've wasted all that time dispatching that crew and exactly. now they're going to have to dispatch the the ambulance that they that you could have called yeah exactly but if you're but if you're 30 miles into the backcountry and there is, uh, you, you've already hiked through. I'm thinking about when, when Hayden and I recently were, were hiking through, and we're hiking through this one area, and I'm like, boy, if you broke your leg back here, you'd be in tr big trouble. I mean, a horse can't even get back here. Yeah, and, yeah, that would be a great time to call a, a helicopter. Well, the helicopter's not getting back there either. Not where we were. It's, there are trees, there's bluffs, there's everything. You're going to have to transport someone to the open field that we walked through on the way now a helicopter could get there easily but so could a horse at that point but where we were it was i mean i'm looking up and i'm like wow there's there's a helicopter's not getting in here at, at all if you broke your leg in here you're in big big trouble okay. this is this is really big but but there is an opportunity to get your person back five miles or two miles back to this open area where you could get a helicopter. But th those, those scenarios are, are probably few and far between. But in that situation, you're still calling the ambulance and meeting them at the trailhead, even though you're 30 miles back in there? Oh, man. It's, you know, it's hard to say. Textbook, by the textbook, you need a 100 by 100 clearing, 100 foot by 100 foot clearing for a helicopter to land. And also, you know, you got to watch out for um, rotor wash. So a helicopter is not going to land in a 100 by 100 clearing 
with uh, in the middle of a pine forest surrounded by tall pines on each side because that rotor wash is going to go, you know, who knows what it's going to do. Right. Um, especially if you're carrying a litter up there, you can start spinning out of control. Hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things can happen. Um, but, um, I mean, if you're 30 miles back and you don't have a plan and you're pretty desperate, go for it. Call a helicopter. Yeah. You know, what, what else are you going to do? Well, you got to call somebody. Yeah. And they may say, yeah. well, we know that area. We're sending these other people. Anyway, that's that's really cool and, and yeah, yeah, um, and I'm I'm not I'm not saying don't call a helicopter. I'm saying a helicopter should be a last priority. Yeah, last resort. Yeah, well, most people, I, I I would imagine that you know we're just casually saying call a helicopter. It's not like you know the number to the helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're probably calling nine one one if yeah. you have if you have um, reception, and if you if you don't, then hopefully you have a sat phone, and if you don't have that. Then the next one is to walk them out mm -hmm. some way or another. Well, that's a really very cool course that I think has opened up a lot of opportunities for you and, and certainly have, have gotten you uh, excited ab about some different possibilities than, than you were a month ago. And um, I love seeing young people have those opportunities of, of learning and just experiencing so many different things and you know when I was your age 20 I was just starting my outdoor career and that was working in Yellowstone you're 20 and you've already worked in Yellowstone and then at two ranches and now done this and now you're going to uh, to start guiding I mean, you're well ahead of where I was and what I was talking about with you earlier was the fact that working in Yellowstone was the was the door. That's that's what opened for me that allowed me to see that there was this whole other this whole other world that I didn't know about. And uh, since then, not only have I sent you out there, or had something to do with you deciding to work out there, but also your two cousins and probably no less than than fifty or sixty other kids over the course of the last 25, 30 years that in scenarios where I'm fishing with their dads and they're like, hey, this is really cool. How'd you get started in, uh, in this career? And I tell them how it all started and working in Yellowstone as a, as a room attendant. And uh, they're like, oh man, I've got a, I've got a 17 year old son. I, I bet he'd love doing that. Do they still, they still have that program? And, and it's like, yeah, I'll give you all the information for it. And, and, uh, and, and the kid actually goes out there and goes to work um, doing something similar to what I did and what you did. And uh, I just think that, um, that that national park opportunity, for me anyway, and I'd like to know about for you, whether you feel the same way, it was a real springboard to many, many, many other opportunities. And it was just such an incredible summer that I spent working in Yellowstone that ultimately led to me having a career in the outdoors. And uh, what do you think? Did that, did that have a similar effect on, on you or as far as then going and working at a ranch and then going and working at, a, at another ranch and kind of working your way up in, in quality uh, of the of the guest ranches and now going and doing something it, it's almost like what you're doing now is 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 honing in on like like something piqued your interest when you were working in Yellowstone and now you're just kind of honing in a little bit more and a little bit more and becoming a little bit more focused in in what your true passion is am I accurate there oh yeah 100 percent 100 percent the national park system is a great starting place for anybody that's interested in the and, and let's be let's be uh, uh, clear that neither one of us worked for the national park service we worked for a, cons a concessioner when when i did it it was a concessioner called tw services that ran all of the concessions within yellowstone national park other national parks have other concessioners you worked for what um, was it called? Yep, Zantara, Zantara, not the National Park Service. Zantara is now the concessioner that took over for TW Services, and uh, Juliet, your cousin, 
work for a different concessioner within Yellowstone National Park. That was um, that that ran the uh, the, the, the stores and the soda parlors. fountains. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. What was that called? That was um, I don't know. I don't know. I I'm struggling to remember the name, but um, basically it, it ran the uh, little gift shops and ice cream stores and little soda fountains. At, at I think Canyon was the only place they did it, right? Was well, it I think Mana they too? did it at a number of of the of the places. I'm not sure, but the the point is is there are many opportunities to work within the national parks. You f you can find out who the concessioner is. There may be multiple concessioners, and uh, and you just put in your application far in advance, and you stand a pretty good chance of getting hired. And I think the minimum age when I did it was 18. I'm not sure what it is now. What yeah, was it's it when you did it? Okay, so tell tell us. A, a little bit about that because honestly uh, I get I get a number of questions on the regular and one of the most regular questions is how I got started and when they find out how I got started how can I or someone I know do something similar to to what you did so a lot has changed since I did it why don't you walk us through the process of how how that happened for you right just from the start yeah, like you wanted to go. You're thinking about. You're thinking Yellowstone might be a good place. I don't know. How, what then? What does the uh, what does the process look like? Do you get on the website and fill out an application? I don't know. What do you do? Yeah, my process was definitely unique in the fact that I actually changed what I did um, midway through, or not midway through, early in the season. Um, but yeah, so you're interested in it. Um, first thing to do would be uh, find which national park is right for you, whether that be Yellowstone, Yosemite, Denali, Zion, to name a few, um, Glacier. Find which one you, you that you want to spend time at and that you want to really explore and get to know way more than any other visitor will know. Then you get online and find the, um, the, the company in charge of, of hiring for that national park, whether it be Zantera or you know any other company and, and look at their website and see the jobs available you definitely the one piece of advice I would tell people looking at this is um, do something that you would do regardless if you were in a national park my mistake was is I worked housekeeping at first because I thought I would get the most time off so I could just fish the whole time I was a little mistaken but, you know, I had a lot of friends that were servers or service assistants, and they loved their job, and they got to hike a lot. Um, servers assistants is an awesome job because you get quite a bit of time off, and you make good money, and the work that you're doing is pretty fun. That's what, um, that's what Finn did his first year, yep, right? Your cousin. Uh, yep. yep. Yeah, um, he was a server. And I guess probably the job choice for someone who is looking for maximum experience and maximum time off in the uh, in the in the parks when you're working there probably changes with concessioners and it probably changes year to year because when I went there I was told that a housekeeper was absolutely the best job for somebody that wanted a lot of time off because that they hired the most and somehow when I was there they hired more housekeepers than they needed that was not the case when you went there and they had you working you know, the full eight hour shift, you had more work than you could do. Me, I had 12 rooms to clean and when I cleaned those, I could go. And uh, I didn't make much money, but it also didn't cost me anything to be spending the summer in Yellowstone. A few hours of work every day and I was good to go. Meals included, board included, and they cut me loose about noon every, every day. And I was able to uh, hike, fish, backpack, all, all over it. Now that changed a bit when you were there and all of a sudden you're calling home and saying, man, this isn't what I thought I was going to do. I'm not getting any time off. And so you looked around and made a change. What, what did you do at that point? Yeah. So housekeeping was not for me. Um, I did it because, uh, like you were saying, you know, when you did it, you were cleaning what, 12 rooms and then, yep. and then going off or maybe fishing 16. every day. It was enough that I could do it at, uh, by noon. 12 or 16. I can't remember. I think it's 16. Yeah, but, um, you know, I was looking at it and be like, man, that sounds like the setup right there. I'm going to do that. 
and uh, got out there. wasn't what I expected. Um, you know, working till five, six, sometimes seven at night. A little understaffed. Some people loved it, but it was not for me. And so I started looking around, and I, and I saw this saw this corral there. And I worked actually in Yellowstone National Park at Roosevelt Lodge. And Roosevelt Lodge is one of two places that has a corral with horses and takes um, horseback rides out. And so I started looking around, and at this point, I think I've been on a horse like like four times in my life. And um, went up to the uh, head wrangler, Billy Taylor, and asked her if 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 I could get a job um, scooping poop there, because I, I would I would I just wanted to get out of the housekeeping scene. I would would have. Um, I wanted to do anything but that. And um, so she got me on a horse and watched me ride. And I must have done something right because um, I ended up getting a job there and, and spent the rest of the summer um, working as a wrangler, taking horseback rides out. And that was a life-changing experience for me. Um, completely blew me away. You know, I was, I was out there taking, taking guests on one to two hour rides, um, which was already awesome. And then it's in Yellowstone National Park which is even more awesome. And then you add to it all the bison, mule deer, and antelope on the trail. I mean, I was getting to chase bison off a t- wild bison off the trail in Yellowstone National Park. Like, who gets to do that? <laughs> that is so cool. And at the time, you were 18 years old. Yeah, and I was 18 years old, uh, just green as could be to the west. Uh, you know, I'm sure my eyes were just as wide as saucers 100% of the time. Um, and it was, it was a very eye-opening and life-changing experience. And I was like, man, you can do this? Well, like, <laughs> I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to do anything else. Um, and from there, you know, I started working on ranches and, and ended up um, getting this elk guiding Why job. Why did you choose not to return to Yellowstone and um, choose to go to a ranch? You know, that's a good question. Um, I... I I think I wanted a little bit more of a um, of a horseman atmosphere. Um, I fell head over heels in love with horses, um, and um, actually considered going to uh, veterinary school to be an equine vet, and ended up changing that after I found out a little bit more about the equine industry and decided <laughs> it wasn't for me. But yeah, I. I wanted a little bit more of a of a uh, serious horseman atmosphere, so I I um, went to Bar W Ranch in Whitefish, Montana, and um, got that pretty pretty um, got that pretty well, and um, had had a blast and loved it. Um, the The Yellowstone deal is great because you have a lot of diversity, like you were saying earlier. There's 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 primarily hikers lots of hikers and backpackers there are some fishermen they can be few and far in between some climbers but lots and lots of hikers because hiking is by far the most accessible easiest to get into and um, is definitely arguably the most fun with your friends yeah and you're talking about the people that are that are surrounding you in the in the dorm atmosphere yeah like when i was there i had a couple of guys nearby that were way into wilderness photography wildlife photography and they would they weren't really interested in much of anything else they would day hike back in with their camera equipment and they would take pictures of bison or moose or bears if they could find them or 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 whatever that's what those guys were into had other people that were into um you know leaving the park every weekend and going down to jackson hole and partying then you had other people that were into mountain climbing, and they would do some of that within Yellowstone National Park, and then they would do some of it down in the Tetons. They would do some of it at, at other mountains outside of Yellowstone. Then we had the heavy-duty backpackers, and we had the, the day hikers, and we had the people that, that kind of liked a little bit of all of it, and we had, we had uh, all different kinds of, of people. And you, as a you know the 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 environment and the community was such that if you didn't have much experience but you showed interest you were welcome like if you wanted to go and see what this guy was doing when he was photographing stuff in the in the wild and you you know got to know him and 
talked to him a little bit and said, hey, I'd love to go out there and learn a little bit about photography and see what you're doing, he'd say, sure, man, can you carry anything? Like, you could carry this pack for me, that'd be awesome. And uh, then I could take this extra lens and you would, you would be able to go out there and experience these things. You could go climb a mountain with this group over here. You could go whitewater rafting with this group over here. You could go fly fishing with this group over here. And with all of those different experiences, you were going with people that knew enough about what they were doing to be safe. They knew enough to be in the right places. And you could either come away from that experience and say, oh my God, that's all I want to do. Or, you know what, that was really super cool, but I want to try fly fishing this weekend. Or I want to try something else this weekend. Or I want to go on a, a three-day backpack uh, instead of just an overnight. And um, that's one of the reasons why I think that the National Park has the national park opportunity for a young person, especially new to the West, that doesn't that hasn't had all of those opportunities. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so incredibly valuable and such a great opportunity for a young person is because you are surrounded by these people that are really into what they're into. And they are, for the most part, pretty open to showing you what that is. For me, there was a guy that was way into fly fishing when I was when I was there. He lived downstairs. Uh, his name was Duke Brown, and uh, Duke and I uh, shared some information and, and never actually went fishing together, but then found ourselves competing against one another, what, almost 10 years later at the Great Outdoor Games. Thought that was quite, a wild, quite that? a wild deal. But uh, yeah, sure, Duke, that was awesome. I'll never forget him, ever. But what, what about your experience? Did you see the same kind of thing? Because you you got to do a lot of different things when you were in Yellowstone, right? Yeah, yeah, I got to do a ton of different things. The people there are awesome. You know, of course you're gonna have your bad eggs and, and people just that just wanna sit in their dorm all day, but for the most part, everybody's into to anything they wanna do. If you're into hiking, people applaud that. Um, that's what I love about the West is that if you're into something and you're passionate about it and you get excited by it, People love it no matter what it is. If you're into whitewater rafting, people love it. People want to see you get excited about it. People want to go with you. If you're into hiking, they love it and they want to go with you. If you're into a, a, a mountain climbing or if you're into a botany, people love it and they, they want to go with you and they want to learn about it. Um, super, super cool atmosphere. I particularly was into um, the, the, uh, the horses um, and it was great. It was it was amazing. I got extremely, extremely, extremely lucky um, in getting a job with almost no horse experience and was trained very quickly and very efficiently by the head wranglers and, and another couple wranglers who took me under their wing and showed me what they know. But um, my deal was I had a uh, basically a 10 mile radius, you know, 10 miles somewhere and 10 miles back where I could ride anywhere that I wanted to. We'd go down to the Yellowstone River and, um, you know, one of my favorite pictures ever, I think I think you guys have it of, um, you know, me sitting on my horse. With, oh, yeah, um, right on the Yellowstone. Yeah, in the Yellowstone River, um, just wading into the Yellowstone River with um, on my horse. And um, we would go every which place. We'd go to the Yellowstone River and we'd fish. We'd go um, to the Lamar River and we'd fish. We'd ride up mountains. We'd go everywhere. And it was so, so cool and I felt head over heels in love with it. Um, some people do that exact same thing with hiking. Some people have never really been hiking out west and and they just they are just completely enamored with it and just love it, love it, love it. And then that changes their life and they go and live in Jackson Hole Wyoming and, and hike every weekend and backpack and then learn to climb. It's a great atmosphere to see a lot of different things and meet a lot of different people and a lot of different kinds of people and really figure out what you like to do, whether you're new to the West or maybe you just haven't done a lot of things in the West. Yeah. I mean, that was my experience too, is that, that being around all those different people that are into what they're into gave me the opportunity to try a lot of different things and then decide out of all those things, what I really like the most and what I would really like to focus on is, is the fly fishing. So the next summer I went down to Jackson and got a, guy, got a job as a, as a fly fishing guide. And that was life changing for me and put me on the path that I'm currently on. But you know, you have other people, I still know one, I'm pretty sure that's still in the park from, from the first year that I went there. 
and there are people that, that go and work in Yellowstone, and they just continue going back to Yellowstone every single summer. I'm sure it's the same for other parks. Your cousin Finn continues to go back to Yellowstone. This is his third yeah, or fourth third year. Third or fourth. He's been yeah. there quite a long time. Yeah, and he, he's a guy that, that really gravitated towards the, the mountaineering and the mountain climbing, but seems to also really like the backpacking and the, and the camping and, and kind of just the, the national park feel. Well, he hiked over 100 miles last year, I think. Yeah, so he's hiking and he's climbing mountains. Whereas, you know, once you decide that you're going to, I mean, once I decided that I was going to go on the fly, I was going to concentrate on fly fishing and become a fly fishing guide. Well, you know, I kind of thought in the beginning, oh, I'll come back to Yellowstone and backpack through here. But that, that just wasn't what happened. I did more backpacking that one summer than I have done since then, all combined in Yellowstone. It's because when you're a, a, a fly fishing guide and you're making your living as a fly fishing guide, everything that you do is fly fishing. And the same holds true for if you turned into a mountaineering guide. You know, you are only mountaineering now. If you're a, if you're a horse packer, now you are horse packing or you're a wrangler. Now it's, it's pretty much you're going to be doing something involving horses pretty much all the time. And so I think for some people, the variety is more of, a, more of a, uh, an attraction than honing in on one thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's all cool. And I think that's one of the things that, they, uh, that the, the park offers that's super cool for young people. Definitely. Um, and so then the, uh, the experience... Like if you were to recommend, if, if someone was to say, oh, you've been working out west before, that's so cool, I want to do that, would you suggest you know, working at, a, at a, a dude ranch or would you suggest you know, trying to work in the national park or should I scoop ice cream in ja on the square in, in Jackson Hole or should I go to Aspen or what do you think? I mean, where do you steer someone like that? Man, that's a good question. And I have quite a few buddies that I've... Um I've recommended um, both to, and it really depends on their personality. Um, I have one buddy that I that I um, that I recommended the same job that I'm that I uh, did when I was 18, working in the Roosevelt corrals, and he's down there right now, uh, James Whiteley. And I have another buddy who um, wanted to get in the fly fishing industry, Thomas Moore, and now he's working in um, Craig, Montana, on the Missouri. So it really depends on. If you know what you want to do, or if you've been exposed to a lot of different things or you haven't, I would say. If you haven't been exposed to a lot of things and you just want to get out west, then I would recommend working in the park. But if you're like, man, look, I've done all these, all these hikes, I've done all these climbs, and yeah, they're great, but dude, all I want to do is fly fish. I'd be like, great, here's a shop, work at it. Yeah, well, where, where does that here's a shop come from? Because some people have never been out there, and they have virtually no experience. Oh, yeah. So how does someone break into that, uh, and it's easier than you think, yeah. I think. So that kind of goes along the same lines of how I um, broke into the, the elk guiding. And my one piece of advice for anybody who's wanting to do that, you know, of course, I would 100% recommend getting fly fishing experience before you do this. But... Once you get fly fishing experience and you're um, and you think you're ready to uh, even just work in a shop or guide, make one contact a day. Do some research. Find out where you want to work, what kind of shop you want to work at, and find those and make a list. And once a day, go down that list and make contact somehow via email, mail, phone call, or or, or letter, and and make one contact a day and talk to these guys and ask them questions and um, introduce yourself to them. And if you do that once a day and you make a list of 50 fly shops, chances are one of those fly shops is gonna hire you, 100%. And that's what I did with, um, with, with elk guiding and, and getting into the elk guiding scene can be very difficult if you weren't born and raised in the West. But make that list and go down and every single day contact those people and make it happen. You can, you can make opportunities happen like that 
pretty easily. Um, yeah. that, that same thing I did with the guest ranch. I think that that may have been some advice that, that I may have given you because Michael Pollock, one of my mentors in the Florida Keys, he gave me some advice when I was first getting started, and this is before the internet, and it's before email, and that is, he, he told me, he's like, I write seven letters a week, and I said, wow, seven, seven letters a week. Who are you writing them to? He goes, I don't know, uh, just, just whoever. You know, I might write some to my customers, I might write some to the rep for the tackle company, I might, um, you know, write one to the clothing company that I like. I don't know. He just he just kind of was kind of vague about it because I don't think he really knew. And and I think that that was not really knowing is the value of that exercise of writing one email a day or writing one letter a day. The value of that exercise is that when you start, you don't know who you're going to write and you don't know what you're going to say. Okay? That seems like a place of, of not knowing what you're doing, and you probably shouldn't start down that road without knowing what you're doing. But you know what you're doing? Is you're reaching out to someone and you're expressing your interest to know more about what they do. That means a lot to someone that owns a business because you know they're just getting applications coming across their desk or whatever, or maybe they're not. Maybe they are actively searching for someone and here comes your email that comes through and this could be that's good advice for someone that's thinking about changing careers that's good advice for a ceo of a company writing one letter a day to who i don't know do some research find something that's interesting to you find somebody you know you have you have all sorts of of opportunities now like linkedin where you can be constantly making contact with people. You can send one message a day saying, hey, look, uh, uh, I see your LinkedIn profile. It looks like we're interested in a couple of the same things. Maybe we should uh, maybe we should exchange an email. Let me tell you what we're doing. Maybe you can tell us what you're doing. Maybe there's some synchronicity here. We can, we can, we can uh, work together on some synergies. Uh, as far as a, a young man, an 18-year-old person that doesn't have any experience working in the fly fishing industry or the mountaineering industry or uh, the the horse, uh, the wrangler uh, business, writing that one letter a day, that one email a day, and actually doing the research to find those fly shops or to find those guest ranches or to find those uh, fly fishing outfitters, that's part of the process. You're showing someone that you've actually done the research, which is more than most people will do, and then you actually reach out. And you know what? There's probably going to be some rejection there. You're probably not going to hear back from, you know, out of, out of 10. Out of 10, you're probably not going to hear back from eight. One's going to, and then the other one's going to say, not interested. And the other one's going to say, are you kidding? Why would I hire somebody that's never done this before? Okay, then you start on your next 10. Eight, you don't hear from. One of them says, well, you know, maybe next summer. And, the, and then that other one says, are you kidding? Why would I hire somebody that doesn't have any experience? Then here's the next 10. Eight you never hear from. And then finally one says, huh, why don't you send me, uh, why don't we talk on the phone? You know, or, or something like that. And you get this glimmer of hope. Maybe that one doesn't work out. Well, next 10 go out. Well, you're only three weeks into this, right? So in three weeks, if you're doing 10 a week, let's say you're really industrious and you're doing 10 a week, now you've made, made contact with 30 different people that could possibly hire you. Man, you keep going down that road, you're going to find an opportunity. And then when you get that opportunity, bust your ass. Be there early, stay there late, and you treat that job like it's, like it's the only job you'll ever have. You do, a, you do the best you can possibly do at every menial task that you're asked to do. And it won't be long before you're not scoop and poop anymore. You're actually the wrangler on the horse. Or you're not, you're not uh, you know, hanging up waiters at the end of the day to dry. You're actually the guy that's sitting in the rowing seat. Uh, you're not you know, the guy that's putting up all the climbing harnesses. You are you know, the, the apprentice climbing guide. It happens like that. It definitely happens like that to where you put in your time you go with a positive attitude and you work really hard and you show real intent on learning everything that you possibly can. Keep your mouth shut, your ears open, and the next thing you know, you've got a good opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, 
once you get there, especially if you don't have any experience, even if you do, ask as many questions as you possibly can and find one person or two people or even better, three people who like you and who are willing to teach. <laughs> and, um, you know, two of my two of my best friends in the world, uh, Cody and Ellie Duggar, who I met at um, working in Yellowstone, uh, they were they were those people that that liked me and didn't get too annoyed by um, all the questions I would ask them. Um, but uh, latch onto those people, ask them, learn from them, um, you know, and, and maybe teach them something that, that they didn't know. Like in my case, it was fly fishing and they, they teach me um, stuff about horses and I'd, I'd show them a new fly or take them to a new spot that they haven't seen before. But, you know, latch on and, and absorb as much as you can. And then just like you were saying, those opportunities will 100% arise. Yeah, that's really cool. So what do you think, uh, what, what are your expectations about what you are, uh, at, what, you're, what you're getting into? The reason why we're going to Montana in July is because it takes as much preparation to get ready for the elk season. And you are going to be doing something out here. I don't really know. I'm sure you're going to be learning all of the, all of the, uh, all of the uh, land that you're going to be hunting. You're going to be uh, making camp. You're going to be packing in. You're going to be training with the older guides. I don't know. What, what, what are your expectations about what you're getting ready to do here? Oh, man. I don't have any, really. I don't have any um, preset expectations except um, to work really hard. But even before I get to the, the um, elk season, I got, I'm, I got a, a pretty packed schedule. I'm you know, heading up to Alberta. Um, to fish for bull trout here in a couple days, and then I'm um, doing a, a, a training with, with Brad McLeod, the ex-Navy SEAL who you did a podcast with, and then August 1st I start, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know what to expect. Um, I know it's going to be tough. The terrain is um, very rough, um, and we are very far back there. We're going to be setting up camp, learning the trails, clearing trails, and then once the elk season starts, I'm going to um, intern for a couple of weeks and, and, and uh, learn as much as I possibly can. Um, because, you know, I do, I, I have a little bit of elk hunting experience, but, you know, very, still very, very green in relation to what these guys, the knowledge these guys have um, and, and the, the quality of, of um, I guess the best words would be uh, guidesmanship that yeah. um that that these guys have and i have so much to learn well i could promise you that you're far ahead of where i was when i started i didn't know shit <laughs> and uh look back and wonder how i ever got the opportunity first of all and how i ever uh made anything out of it secondly but uh yeah you're you're way further along and and it's so exciting really to to see that um that you're creating these opportunities because a lot of people might think that I'm creating these opportunities for you, but that's not true at all. You are creating these opportunities for yourself. Maybe I planted a seed at some point and maybe I've given you a little bit of direction or a little bit of encouragement here or there, but you know, you are doing these things yourself. And uh, that to me is incredibly rewarding to see that you have something that you want to do and that you are doing what it takes to get there with with everything that's included disappointment being unsure or 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 embarrassed to make that call or write that email or write that letter because you don't know what to expect but that's all part of the process and uh it's sometimes hard to watch somebody that you love to go through something like that but to see it actually pan out and work is so rewarding it's amazing and uh you know kudos to you for doing it and um i am going to be incredibly interested in what goes on uh in your training and uh i want you to put me on my first elk i've never <laughs> i've never killed one so i'm looking forward to uh looking forward to you uh getting all dialed in absolutely. and saving me a saving me a day or two absolutely yeah i'd love to um from my understanding we're we're pretty busy you know of course the uh first year guide is going to be the uh the do-it-all man at camp 
and uh, the, the chores guy is, is what I'm expecting. Um, but that all that all uh, comes with it. When I was working in Yellowstone, I was I was that dude and um, just worked my tail off and and you know did everything I was asked and then some. And um, people really respected that. And I was given opportunities that you know some of the people that were there way before me weren't given because they didn't they didn't work as hard. How do, how do you do you remember when you first get on with uh, with a with a group and and I know that. You know, in, in a group of, of hunting guides or a group of wranglers or a group of fishing guides, there's some hard people there. And uh, usually hard people, in my experience, have a really good sense of humor. They like to give it, and they don't like to, to get it back as far as, you know, giving each other shit. They're really great at it, like on a Steve <laughs> Roger level yeah. of giving shit. Yep. And uh, how, how do you... How do you deal with that as a young person? When you're the youngest person coming in, which I was once, but I'd like to know your perspective on how you, how you deal with that. Somebody gives you a nickname, they call you Howdy Doody when you first walk up, <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh shit, here we go. How, how do you do, what do you do? Like, do you embrace that nickname? Do you, what do you do? Oh man, well, I have been um, particularly blessed because I've been, the youngest person in most groups that I've um, gone on, whether it's the the RRL or um, Seal Fit when I was 16, so I, that was not necessarily comfortable. The for RRL, me. the RRL is my workout group where Turner came to the morning sessions in the workout group. He was the youngest person there by 35 years, <laughs> and 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 we also like to give each other a hard time. So people are definitely giving giving Turner a hard time. He came there for what, a year or more. Oh yeah, every morning. Yeah. Um, so anyway, just wanted to clear that up. So whether it's the RRL or Seal Fit or Yellowstone or the Ranch, the Bar W, yeah. you've been the youngest person many times, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's um, for someone that's not used to being the youngest person, it can be very difficult to deal with. But, um, you know, because of, because of some of the things I've done, I was uh, not necessarily comfortable, but kind of comfortable with the uncomfortable that that brought. And, um, you know, wranglers aren't um, the, usually the softest people, and um, neither, are, neither are hunting or fishing guides. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of shit that was, that was um, thrown my way. What I... What I did, um, I just kept my <laughs> I just kept my mouth shut and um, just worked my tail off. And then uh, when the um, when the uh, play got a little too rough, I gave it right back. And uh, we'd have I remember uh, I remember I would wait for my the perfect opportunity. Um, and you know, growing up as a as a wrestler and wrestling for you know however long um, since elementary school. Uh, I had definitely had an advantage over them um, that they didn't know about. We would play this game, uh, Indian arm wrestling, where uh, you would stand with your left foot together. You would stand across from one another, and you put your left foot out in a staggered stance, and your left foot feet would be beside each other, and you would uh, pretty much try to knock the other person over. Could and you move your foot? No, you can't move your feet. If you move your feet, you're done, and if you fall down, you're done. That's I'm trying to think of a better way to explain it. Do you have your hands clasped? So yeah. Your left foot's together, and your left hands are so your together? left. Yeah, you're a, you're in a staggered stance, and your left foot is is with the left foot of your opponent, um, like side by side, and then you grab right hands together, or you know if your right foot's forward, mm -hmm. left hands together, and you would try to knock each other down. I, I beat everybody there at that. Um, so that was kind of my little way of, uh, of just, you know, showing them that I'm, that I'm there to stay. Um, and then, of course, they would, after that was over, they'd, they'd get a, a few of them and get the rope out and, <laughs> uh, you know, do some a little initiation. Um, but you know, just keeping just keeping your mouth shut and your head down and and, and learning and um, um, 
you know, just waiting for that moment where you can, um, where you can give them a little taste. Well, so often when somebody is giving you a nickname or somebody is, is messing with you like that, it's actually because they like you and they're just testing you to see what you're made of. And if you pass that test, you don't have any more of that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, and that happens so often. I was just reading uh, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules to Life. It's, it's amazing. And, and uh, he, has a, he has a story in there about working on the, the railroad and uh, being around a lot of hard people and getting a nickname and how he dealt with it. And he just kind of worked hard. And, and actually, that's where I came up with the Howdy Doody. He, they called him Howdy Doody. And he finally asked somebody why they called him Howdy Doody. And they said, because you look nothing like Howdy Doody. <laughs> and so he's like, OK. And so he worked hard and worked hard and just kept, you know, took it, took it all in stride, had a positive attitude. He did his work. He helped others. And uh, soon his nickname went from Howdy Doody to just Howdy. And he kind of liked Howdy because it was kind of Western and, and that was cool. And then this other guy shows up with a, uh, with a real fancy lunch, lunch pail. And it looked kind of like his mom might have bought his lunch pail and packed it for him. So, of course, that draws immediate attention as everyone else has a brown paper sack. So they started calling him Lunch Bucket. <laughs> and Lunch Bucket didn't like that at all and resisted the nickname badly. And uh, they wore hard hats. And so not only were they calling him Lunch Bucket, and ever, the more he resisted it, the more they called him Lunch Bucket. And the more sinister that, that started sounding as he resisted and, and wasn't, wasn't kind of playing along and didn't want to do his work and complained about everything. And soon they started throwing these little pebbles at him and hitting him in the in the hard hat with him and it would kind of make a ding noise and he still resisted and still was not not playing along and still was was being a bad sport about the whole thing and the the pebbles got larger and progressively larger and progressively larger until they were just basically throwing rocks at him <laughs> and, and then at that point he just didn't show up anymore it was two different ways of of dealing with with the ribbing that you get and that's what it is. It's ribbing. And it's, it's uh, you know, either in, in, in Jordan Peterson's case, this guy doesn't seem so bad. Let's test him a little bit. And if he's still not so bad, then he'll be one of us. Versus lunch pail, this guy seems like a super douche right away. Let's give him some shit and see if he breaks. And sure enough, he started to break. And so they just put the pressure on until he to totally broke. And they got rid of him. And that happens. So I don't know. As a young person, you get into situations like that. And my suggestion is just to embrace it. And for the most part, if they're, if they're not even talking to you, they really don't like you. If they give you a nickname and start giving you shit, they're starting to like you. If that nickname and that shit starts to get worse, they might like you even a little bit more. And then if you can just handle that, it tends to go away and you become part of the group. Oh yeah. That's been my experience. Yeah. I think the best thing that I did was just, um, you know, keep my head down, keep my mouth shut, work hard and then help, help them. You know, if they, uh, if they're taking five horses out at once, be like, Hey man, let me grab, let me grab three of those horses. You know, if they, if they have to go and stack hay, be like, yeah, I'll, I'll come yeah, along Yeah, do the you. dirty work. I'll stack hay with you. You do the yeah, dirty work. do the work that nobody yeah. wants to do, and, and they, they start to like you. Oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta scoop this poop over here. I got to move these uh, wheelbarrows full of this horse crap to this other spot. And I don't want to do that. But I'll do that for you, man. Then they, they start to like you, and it's, you know, of course they're giving you shit because they... <laughs> You know they like you, but you know I, I was never really afraid to um, to to put my foot down a little bit, um, which I, I think I think is a good thing. But that might have just shown my uh, my immaturity <laughs> when I was 18. Yeah. But who knows? I'm, I mean that whole group was awesome. Um, you know they were just doing that because they liked me. And then uh, once they once once I kind of got into that circle, you know there was they were great friends. And I'm still friends with, with a few of them to this day. A couple of them are working uh, just right outside the park at a guest ranch. They kind of went 
down that 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 uh, ranch road, like like I did, and started and started working there. And now they're working at probably I would say the highest quality guest ranch in Montana. So there's opportunities for that, and then there's opportunities to um, pack, which is an awesome thing to do because it opens up so many opportunities. You can go and and work for a company's company like uh, like Jake's Horses and pack into Slough Creek for like six days, five or six days with a family. And all you got to do is make sure that they're fed and they don't get eaten by bears and you're free to fish and explore and do whatever you want as long as they're happy, they're safe, and your horses are happy and safe. So it's a pretty cool gig if you want to get into that um, that that side. Well, of there's just too. so many opportunities and, and really... I enjoy opening that door or helping to not not open that door. I don't enjoy opening the door. I enjoy pointing out the door to people and letting them open it for themselves. And some people really enjoy it. Some people go down that road uh, for a couple of years. Some people go down that road for many years. And it's a complete life change. Either way, the uh, the opportunity to work out west exists it's not just out west in, in national parks you could go work in the everglades you could go work uh at at, uh, at at just about any national park that has services some don't like the dry tortugas or something like that i think you'd have to be working for the park service to be getting some kind of a job out there but for the most part if the if the national park has hotels and stores and stuff like that there's some kind of concessioner that that offers jobs there and uh usually provides meals and and board as well and um, it just has been an eye-opening experience and really a lifetime experience for me and uh, and my son and my niece and nephew have both done it and so if you know somebody that that might like that road it's certainly a good road to go down we'll put the the Yellowstone information in the show notes or you can google it for yourself but eh, it's not the only thing to do but it's a good thing to do if if you don't know of other opportunities. That one definitely exists. It's the the uh, barrier for entry is basically the time at which you put in your application, rather than who you know or what experience you have. There is a way for someone that has no experience and has never done anything outside to be a server in a national park to uh, to work behind the counter like my niece did scooping ice cream and and uh and serving lunch or like i did be a room attendant or like turner did be an actual wrangler uh many 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 opportunities such a such a cool thing that exists in our national parks a lot of people don't know about it some people do either way turner's a a good example of somebody that that uh it, it has done a lot for in his life it led him to go to montana state university and, and now he's headed down this road of, uh, of moving into the hunting world. And, um, and you know, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But as always, I appreciate you, Turner, uh, being a guest on the show and, and talking about all these things. It's really cool. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Um, there's certainly a lot of questions that come in about that. If you like this show, please go to uh, iTunes, rate and review it. That really helps with the placement. Share it with others and share it on your social media if it's something that you uh, found useful. And then also, we're putting out these podcasts every week. And I have been tracking down a lot of people that you have been sending me emails for. Lots of good suggestions there. So if you have suggestions, podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can email me. I will receive that directly. I'll read it myself. And you can uh, give me give me some suggestions of people, either icons, up and comers, or people doing something crazy outside. I'm interested. If you're interested, I'm interested. So send me those those uh, suggestions. And also, I want to thank everybody who has sent all the emails lately. Uh, the inbox has truly overflowed with emails, uh, and people are saying really really nice things about the podcast. I appreciate it. I enjoy doing it and uh, hope that we can continue. I'm going to do 52 episodes 
and we're going to see what happens after that. So let's make this thing grow and uh, we'll keep doing it. But uh, anyway, Turner, thank you for being on the show and we'll look forward to catching up with you after elk season. We'll do another podcast around Christmas. See how the season went for you. Deal? Deal. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.